Welcome to the Solo Mo Show, a weekly podcast hosted by Corey O'Brien, the social media strategist at Heat and author of thefutureofads.com. And I'm Adam Helway, CEO of the digital market agency Secret Sushi Creative. Each episode, we discuss topics, trends, and tactics related to social, local, and mobile marketing. Our goal is to help you understand these topics so you can integrate them into your own efforts. Today is June 12th, 2012, and this is episode number 23. In this episode, we'll be discussing Apple's of announcements at WWDC, the brand spanking new Foursquare, and plenty of other topics. There you go. Quite the show. Quite the show lined up. And we're going to try to keep it a little less than last week, despite the fact that we... A little less. We tried our best to keep the time down. We were having <laughs> a little fun out at the opening of the Soma Street Food Park and as such, we had a bunch of interviews and all sorts of things we were wrapping together, and it ended up being one of our longest episodes ever, though I think it was filled with quality content, so uh, make sure to check that episode out as well. That was last week's episode. But We could have done it in two portions, no pun intended, right? We definitely could have cut that in half, had a little dessert episode, but uh, <laughs> it is what it is, so we'll try to keep this one short. And uh, with that goal, I think we could just dive right into some of the news. Uh, Adam, do you want to cover the latest goings-on with the show? Yeah, so, uh, you know, first and foremost, as we've discussed the last few weeks, we are still and uh, going to be uh, for the foreseeable future uh, syndicated every single Saturday at socialmediaexplorer.com. Uh, I'm a contributing author over there and have been for a couple of years. And Jason Falls has been uh, kind enough to allow us to cover uh, the weekend spot there. And so uh, we, of course, the show is going to be on our website, but we also syndicate it over there. For, so if you are a subscriber of that uh, blog, then you will get our content as well. And if you have not gone to socialmediaexplorer.com, then you must do so. It's actually one of the top digital marketing blogs out there. So the other news that we have is this is the last, I repeat, the last episode that we will be talking about and giving away free tickets to the Social Loco Conference in San Francisco, which happens this coming Monday. We are sponsors over there, and we will be uh, present there. Both Corey and I have attended the event as attendees and as people on panels at the event. Um, Mark Evans and his team, um, they're just awesome folks. And, uh, again, they, uh, they have, uh, only just a few more days here until the event, which is on Monday. If you use the promo code, uh, it, for, uh, we have a promo code that is MP solo mo S O L O M O 25. And that gets you 25% off, uh, the current ticket price. And, uh, again, we'll be kind of doing what we call the social media or the social, uh, social local back channel over there and showing uh, and doing some interviews and so on. So we'll actually bring some content to you in a few weeks, uh, when we come back from that, uh, from the social loco conference. So go to socialloco.net in order to check out who's going to be speaking folks from Google, Facebook, Foursquare. Uh, in fact, I just talked to Mark today and he said that there's going to be some, uh, at least, four or five announcements that are going to be there. So folks are sharing some good news to share at that event. So uh, get out there and uh, check that out. And because we will be at that conference, next week is going to be a little funky. I don't think we're going to be doing our typical live show on Tuesday. We'll be doing a whole bunch of recording on Monday, piecing that all together and then uh, making that into an episode. So we will be doing our best to bring as much of Monday's content live, so you can tune into that, but uh, we will not be doing our regularly scheduled Tuesday broadcast. So if you tune into that, make sure to tune in a day early on Monday to get those social loco updates. That's going to be very exciting. And we are going to try to broadcast some of our interviews throughout the day uh, on Google Hangouts, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're going to try to bring as much of that live as we can, and then we'll be repurposing that and turning that into... At least one, if not multiple episodes, uh, but we will also be sharing some of that live as well via the Google Hangout. So check that out. All right, man. So what's next? What's for our infographic of the day, or of, the, of the episode? Our infographic of the episode. So we actually have two, but they're, uh, they're ones we can cover pretty quickly. So we will dive right into those. The first up is a infographic about Mike Bloomberg declaring April 16th Foursquare Day in New York City. So... We've actually talked about Foursquare Day a little bit in the past on the Solo Mo show, and really what it was is Foursquare acknowledging, hey, 
416 is 4 squared. We should make a day out of it. It started with the users, and then Foursquare kind of picked up and said, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Let's run with that. And Foursquare, being a company out of New York, of course, they have great ties to the city. So Mike Bloomberg, who I believe is the actual mayor of New York City, not just the Foursquare mayor, but the... <laughs> voted into office mayor of New York City said hey this is a great thing this is you know one of the shining stars of our tech community let's make April 16th official Foursquare Day in New York City and what's cool about it is he he did this because he really understands social media or at least the the team that helps him in office understands social media he's got channels on Facebook and Twitter and yes he does actually have a Foursquare account and so what he did is he put together an infographic that talks about his own participation on Foursquare as part of this announcement of Foursquare Day. So it's it's serving dual purpose. It's saying, hey, let's celebrate Foursquare and also, you know, hey, celebrate me and maybe reelect me if you like all the social media stuff I'm doing. So, you know, it you, shows, mean it's, you mean it's political? Is that what you're saying? I, I don't want to, you know, throw anybody under the bus here, but I am going to say that there was probably a little bit of political motivation, which is fine. You know, it's, it's <laughs> good info. He's, he's helping out Foursquare with some promotion, but there was a little bit of promotion for him and a little bit of promotion for Foursquare, which is actually something we'll talk about. So, you know, just to go through the stats really quick, 339 days out, he basically checked in every single day. He was doing something, I'm sure, as the mayor, the actual mayor of New York. He's a very busy man, so when he's out and about, he's using Foursquare. He's got nearly 6,000 followers. He checked in almost 600 times, so almost two check-ins per day, which means, you know, he's not just doing it. He does a whole bunch one day and then totally forgets about it for the rest of the month. He is an actual active Foursquare user. But it, it's one of them is the mayor's pad, by the way. That's <laughs> yes, he's I, checking into. I think he is actually the mayor of City Hall, which which is ironic, but but makes total sense. Exactly. Uh, but he's actually left 222 tips, so he's giving back to the community. He's posting a lot of good quality content, so... Some of his most popular tips are at JFK International Airport. He says, welcome to NYC. Be sure to visit my CGO to get tips on great things to do and see. That's been done by 141 people. Um, At the Shake Shack, he said, I joined the ribbon cutting ceremony for this new Shake Shack. That was actually done by 36 people. So, you know, he's, he's putting content out there. People are doing it. It's really this interactive account, which I like to see. Um, And so, Part of what this strikes me as is a great example of taking the story that you have as a brand of using some of these social channels and figuring out better ways to tell that story. So in this case, he's using an infographic. He's using the visual language of Foursquare. So he's he's saying, you know, hey, I get it. I understand this network. I'm not just trying to, you know, repurpose it for my own for my own gain. I'm really embracing this community i'm giving back to it i'm posting tips i'm part of these super swarms he's an actual genuine user of foursquare and as such he's proud to kind of talk about that and display that so as a brand i think this is a great example of telling a good story about your own participation doing it in an interesting way giving back to the community you know creating foursquare day which I think when we talked about foursquare day initially we said you know what what's a holiday that your brand could adopt so it doesn't have to be you know, 416. It doesn't have to be as cute as that is or as perfect as that is, but maybe you're a donut shop and you want to go big on National Donut Day. So you put together, you know, a list of the best donuts and and spread that around on Foursquare and then put together an infographic of all the people that checked in to those various donut shops on Donut Day or something like that. You know, I don't think you have to overthink it here. It's it's it should be easy and it should be fun, but you know, look at this as, as an example of what can happen when you just put a little work into telling that story. Yeah, I have a tendency to 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 suddenly see that it's some random whatever day when you go to Facebook and everybody's suddenly talking about and showing photos or whatever. It's you know today is uh, Super Burrito Day or something like that. They, uh, those sorts of uh, memes uh you know have legs nowadays uh, uh even even holidays like you were talking about latching onto a holiday that actually exists and in a lot of cases it seems like folks you know especially brands are creating these sort of you know holidays with the with the hope that um you know the first year it's gonna take a little while to to to, to uh, create some awareness and then the year after that it'll just kind of have s- some legs and folks will actually kind of anticipate and plan for those sorts of things uh just simply i mean that's what Foursquare did uh, with their Foursquare day, right? I mean, it was just kind of community created, I believe. Yep. Uh, and then it rolled into something uh, bigger. So kind of interesting to see him take a hold of this a bit here and, and have it here on his blog. Yeah. So 
The next thing we wanted to talk about is a quick little post by Simply Measured where they studied tweets coming off of the Worldwide Developer Conference keynote and then graphed that to show when specific spikes happened in terms of what people were talking about as the keynote progressed. And so what it's doing is showing that following some of these big announcements, you'd see these huge spikes in conversation. And for some of those, that kind of continued on throughout the keynote. So you can tell, you know, what got people excited first when it was announced and what really sparked conversation. So breaking down a couple of those stats, 18% of all tweets were about iOS. So I think that was interesting. It, it you know, basically one in every five tweets was about iOS. MacBook came in second with 15%, which considering this was a developer conference, I, I also think it's interesting that a actual technology announcement came in second place with 15%. Um, Lion came in third with 6%, and then even though there was no announcement about the new iPhone, it actually had 5% of all tweets during Worldwide Developer Conference. So basically people asking, you know, is the new iPhone going to get announced? Or I wish they had said something about the iPhone, or what's going on with the iPhone? So, you know, interesting that that still had some legs. Um, the event itself peaked at 2,119 tweets per minute, which is, you know, still kind of boggles my mind that that much content is flowing back and forth. And then over the course of, you know, basically the the period with which they were looking at it, both leading up to the keynote and then following it, there were a total of 151,000 tweets sent. So a lot of good data here. I encourage you to check it out. It's a good example of telling a story with data. They've got a lot of good, you know, colored graphs that you can compare. Okay, well, here's where a spike in people talking against about maps happened. But while that was happening, this conversation about iOS was still going on or, you know, MacBook, that caused the biggest spike of the day following that announcement, but it also continued to drive conversation throughout. So you can it's see kind of the things. ebb and flow, right? It's like the, the, you get to see the ebb and flow of the conversation that's happening. Yes, exactly. Ebb and flow, but also, you know, you can see what really people got excited about. Maybe if you're a technology company and you want to know, OK, what should I target the next couple of blog posts that I write about if I want to write about this Apple event? Maybe you'd want to look at something like a MacBook and talk about iOS because those are the two hot topics. And if you can add to that conversation, your tweets and your participation are more likely to reach an audience that's eager to hear things versus something like a Maps, which did cause a little spike, but it didn't have the same amount of overall uh, conversation as the rest of the event did. And I do want to say that... Corey did not believe they were going to release hardware, but uh, we'll get to that in a second when we talk about some of the other topics we have. I was corrected, and I did admit defeat during the <laughs> keynote. I was one of these tweets where I was saying to Adam, hey, I, I was wrong, but at the same time, I was very happy to be wrong. I like going to one of those keynotes and being surprised by their announcements and, and liking what gets announced that surprises me. So I was yep. definitely uh, wrong in my prediction, but happy to be wrong. And with that, let's dive right into the actual keynote itself and uh, talk about some of the announcements talk about what you as a business need to take away from this event because you know i think what's interesting is apple with a single event really sets the tone for the entire technology industry which includes you know marketing it includes advertising it includes online web development it really controls the flow of conversation and the flow of technologies for a lot of different industries so it's important to pay attention to these events that they have Look for trends. Look for, you know, six months out, where is the industry going to be at Apple's lead? And then preparing yourself to, you know, take some of those lessons and run with them. So there was a lot going on. Is there anything that you want to start out with specifically, Adam? I think uh, I'll, I will give you first first choice on things you want to talk about. I kind of what I do want to talk about. I'm going to wait for a little bit because I want to. I don't want to get to the good stuff, like the super good stuff, just yet. All right. But uh, but I think you know, in in what we have here for some of the show notes, I think it makes sense to, um, you know, when you think of hardware like a computer, and you think, well, how does that computer really change anything that I'm doing? It's a laptop, and it has better specs, and might be faster, and you know, higher resolution. But what does that all mean? Uh, and uh, what, what Corey is, is kind of noted here, which completely makes sense and is spot on, is that uh, now with the Retina display that they're starting to uh, roll out here with their MacBook Pros, and they do have their old MacBook Pros that are non-Retina you know, display, but this is essential, like you said, they set the tone, which means that here on out, 
they're going to uh, do two things. One, they've now set the stage for all the other competitors who are going to have to try to m- m- match them with uh, with what they're doing. Uh, and then two is that from here on out, I wouldn't imagine that they're going to do you know every year, uh, if if not the next year, they're they're going to phase out the regular hard or the regular uh, resolution monitors on their MacBook. So every single product they have is going to have a uh, Retina display if it has a display on it. And, and, uh, and w- just to clarify, so the Retina display is the same technology that Apple already has in their latest iPad and they've got in the latest iPhone. It's basically a extremely high resolution display. It's actually 220 pixels per inch, which though slightly less than the iPhone and the iPad, you're holding your computer a little further away. So Apple defines it as a resolution at which your eyes cannot actually determine individual pixels. You basically, it looks like it was drawn directly on the screen. And so their top of the line MacBook now includes this display that basically has four times as many pixels as their previous laptop did. So just wanted to make that, uh, explain that if you didn't have a chance to check out the keynote. Yeah. So, I mean, imagine for instance, taking Legos, which are squares and building out a, a, a kind of an image of something using these Legos as, as you know, what would be in this case, pixels on a wall or on the floor or something, but then being able to somehow arrange pixel, arrange Legos that instead of being, you know, like an inch or a quarter of an inch wide that are just the tiniest things like less than a grain of sand. So, so small that you can arrange them in a way that, that your, uh, that, that your eye cannot discern, like, like Corey was saying. And so that's, that's why the pixel density matters so much. And it sounds like a really technical thing, but again, from here on out, the, the visual quality of content has an opportunity now to really shine even more so than it did before, because the human eye sees uh, many more colors and uh, and and much more fine detail and does some amazing things that no, no technology out there right now really can get close to um, to, to really meeting. And uh, so, for instance, when you look at your website and you choose a, a specific color, well, there's only a certain range of colors when you do design. For instance, when we work on design projects, there's only a certain range of color that we have to choose from. Uh, and those colors can shift from device to device because there's such a, a such a range. With this monitor now, uh, in addition to the, the monitor, the excuse me, the retina display that's now on the, the, the new iPad as well as the old iPhone, as Corey was saying, uh, you have a chance to... To, well, it's not just a chance. It's almost a man, it's almost mandatory to now consider when you create branded applications, even when you potentially do mobile websites and so on, how you're going to address um, leveraging, especially when it comes to the applications, creating assets that are going to be um, higher in resolution and that are going to uh, take advantage of the quality now available on, of course, the mobile apps, which have been around for a while because of the retina displays. But now with, for instance, Mac applications and other applications, uh, other software that you might run on, on Apple. And of course, that may end up starting to bleed over into Windows as people start to create hardware that supports that sort of thing. Yeah, and I think, you know, the the immediate action for this would probably be to find the latest iPad and pull up your site on that and see what that looks like. Because I imagine for a lot of people running out and buying a $2,200 notebook is not, you know, the easiest way to preview this thing. But you can actually get the similar effect of previewing your website by loading it up on the iPad. So one of the examples that I've seen used recently is Pinterest, actually. If you look at Pinterest's site, and you look at their logo on one of these retina displays, it actually looks really bad. And what's ironic about the retina display is, while things optimized for the retina display look really good on it, things that used to look okay on an older style display actually look worse on a retina display. And it has to do with you know the number of pixels and how the, the screen is trying to interpret those pixels. But you know, go and, and pick up an iPad or maybe run into the Apple store and load up your site on one of these new MacBook Pros and just take a look at what your site looks like because you may find out, you know, hey, this this actually doesn't look that good and I should take some immediate steps to, you know, push out higher resolution assets and make sure it does look better on these high res displays. If everything looks okay and it's just not optimized, I think there's a little bit of uh, a little bit of room to play with it. So I would say, you know, six to twelve months out is probably when you really start when you really need to start thinking about putting these assets out. You know, for the next six to twelve months, people that have retina displays, it's going to be great for them. But for most of your audience, they're just not going to have the the displays capable of even producing or displaying these high res assets. But 
you know, I think six to 12 months out, it, it's going to be something that's kind of expected of a modern website that it's able to display assets optimized to these different devices. And one of the tricks is that there's actually not a best practice yet for how to code this. So HTML doesn't have a tag that says, hey, if this is a retina display, show this image. And if it's not a retina display, show this image. It kind of has to load this really high res image and then scale it down if it's not a retina display. And so one of the tricks is waiting for the code to catch up so that instead of having to serve that really big image that's going to take up a lot of bandwidth, if the person doesn't actually need it, you can say, hey, here's both of the images and pick and choose the one that you need. So that doesn't yet exist, but keep an eye out because now that this, you know, retina display is out and like Adam said, a lot of Windows computers are going to follow suit, HTML should shortly follow behind and say, hey, this is how you should be coding this. Here's how to actually identify a high-res asset compared to a normal resolution asset. Well, and, and I will say that there is some um, there is some code that's starting to move in that direction, and uh, and so we are we are playing with it a little bit. For instance, on our side, uh, when it comes to serving up the the right density graphics and so on, but it definitely adds some um, some time and some effort and so on to what you're doing and what you're producing. And uh, I think the moral of the story is it's not necessarily mandatory. But it's it's just right now the kind of initial you know steps are happening for when we're kind of going to have an HD web, I guess you might say. Um, so uh, just keep an eye out for that and pay attention, especially when some of the Windows um, uh, some of the Windows operating system you know PC manufacturers out there start touting their high resolution uh, stuff because they've they've already started doing so with their mobile uh, devices. All right. So what's up next? Let's see. The, I think let's go on to the passbook, which I think is really, really interesting. You want to explain uh, how the passbook works and what it is? Sure. So passbook is basically Apple's first step towards a walletless future. Um, and what it's doing now is aggregating things that have what they're calling passes. So think of this as your airplane boarding pass that has a little QR code on it that they can scan or a gift card that has a barcode that somebody can scan or even the one that I like personally is the Starbucks application, which already uses a code that Starbucks can scan to credit your account and, and basically allow you to pay for drinks with your phone. And so now instead of having just a specific Starbucks application, this passbook brings all of those together into a single application and lets you do things like check in a flights or pay for things at Starbucks or, you know, go to an event that you have a ticket for. It does all of that inside of the single application. And a couple of the neat features of it are that, you know, one, you can actually geofence these cards. And Square does something similar where when you're near the place that you would actually need to use the card, it just automatically pops up on your screen. So every time you walk into a Starbucks that you've selected as, hey, these are the Starbucks I frequent, it'll actually make that card automatically available, which really neat. And then it can also do time-based updates. So again, we mentioned that you can have an airline boarding pass. It has the information for your flight built into that boarding pass. So an hour before you need to get on your flight, that pops up on your screen and it's already ready to go and you take your phone out of your pocket. Really cool stuff there. Yeah, and so like you said, it's kind of like the wallet list feature. And funny enough is I saw somebody tweet something regarding, I think it might have been a, a, a post that was, uh, you know, like a blog post that somebody wrote in the last week uh, before the the, the, um, the announcements about the wallet that the, the future wallet is the same as your current wallet or something like that. And, and I didn't really get to read the post, but in thinking about it, you know, in essence, even if you end up having these cards, so to speak, or these passes on your device, it still is similar to having one in your wallet where you have to take the time to grab it and look for it and pull it out. Uh, uh, you're, you're essentially keeping it, you know, collection of these things in a, uh, in a device, just like you would keep a collection of them in your wallet. But I think what you, exactly what you pointed out that now there, there, there are, uh, there's the ability to keep them live. There's the ability to have them be aware of where you are and so on. Uh, and so it'll be really interesting to see, if this, if enough folks use this, and if if they make they, uh, they go because because obviously brands were on board with this so far. There's Starbucks was showing off their card, uh, Target, um, uh, the, some of the movie theaters, and so on. And so, if the the average person starts to learn have this learned behavior of 
hey, I can go now and use Passbook. If it becomes one of those features that they use versus some a lot, a lot of the other features, not a lot of them, but there are a number of power features almost that you would call it where the normal person it would make their life easy, but for whatever reason, they've never really used it. Mm-hmm. Um, it would it would really change the the behavior pattern of the average consumer and have they would have an expectation or they would they would maybe even gravitate towards brands that would allow them to leverage their passbook passes a bit more uh, and you could you know kind of think about these things like geofencing uh, and live data and other things that are likely available with the API to use it to your advantage and why wouldn't you want to be there at all times? Uh, and, and available and, and be able to kind of interact with folks um, uh, right there during, especially what seems to be, you know, most of these, I think, if not all of these things are, are during, you know, purchase decision times and uh, during times when you're spending money, except for, of course, you know, m- when you have a your, your airfare, your plane, uh, your, your uh, boarding pass, excuse me. Um, I think, you know, we'll likely see somebody like Eventbrite use it so that now when you use your, when you get those tickets on Eventbrite, instead of having to save them elsewhere, you could have one Eventbrite passbook that would have multiple tickets. So I don't know about, you know, I know you likely Corey, you buy tickets from Eventbrite and probably from other places that are digital ticket uh, companies and they can really kind of take off in a way like this now where you could have all of your tickets there and uh, even kind of, if you have multiple events that are using the same vendor, you could have them all in one place. Yeah. And I think, an easy way for a small business to get involved in this would be to look for one of those first third-party applications to get integrated. So last week, we actually talked about Level Up, and Level Up uses a QR code to actually access your wallet. So you're paying for things with a QR code. It's going to be super easy for Level Up to integrate for into Passbook, and so I'm sure they're already digging through the API and saying, how do we get into Passbook? This is going to be huge for us. So If you're a small business, it's probably going to be a little challenging right off the bat to create your own thing that integrates in a passbook, gives you your own card. But I think that's a little advanced for smaller brands. If you're a big brand, sure, go after that, create your own passbook, you know, make that super simple. But if you're a smaller brand, keep an eye out for some of these third party services that say, hey, we're now passbook compatible and users can use this app to pay at the at your store using the passbook and keep track of things like receipts because i think like adam said it's all about purchase uh both the period of purchase and the period leading up to purchase and the smoother you can make that process the happier you're keeping your customers the more likely you are to have return customers so you know be a little bit forward thinking here and go out and say all right what third party applications are going to enable me to get into the passbook without having to develop my own passbook card and, and and I'd quickly say that think of this as as something that allows folks to interact with um, you know like gift certificates, so something that they've already prepaid for, like the Starbucks side, and then also uh, think of it as a loyalty card. So if there's a, a way to use it as a um, way to you know to scan and track, like okay, if you get I, 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 they didn't show this implement in implementation, but if I got five purchases, then the sixth one is free or something like that. I don't see any reason why this can't be used in exactly the same way anything that would be on a card that you would bring and that you would get scanned is going to have the the same you know should have the same uh, applications in this sense so uh, i think what seems like something somewhat small uh, actually could have a really uh, broad future and quite honestly my prediction is Corey, as we're recording it here on the episode is that passbook will actually turn into a full-blown wallet payment application in a year from now yeah, I think so as well. I think Passbook equally or easily adds NFC to the process. Suddenly you're just tapping your phone, Passbook takes care of all the receipts, and your phone has now become a full mobile wallet, not just a carryover to the future mobile wallet. So I totally agree with that prediction. But we'll dig into that in a, in a future episode because I, I know you and I are passionate about those sorts of topics. There you go. So, so what's next? Up next, I figured maybe we can dive into maps because I think... Yep. Again, continuing on this trend of what's interesting for the small to mid-sized business, Maps is probably one of the most important things to pay attention to out of this entire event. And um, specifically, I think there were a couple interesting topics to discuss here. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about was the integration of both Siri and OpenTable into Maps. So with this new Siri integration, so Apple during the event basically announced a bunch of new updates to Siri, and one of which is that 
in addition to just saying, you know, hey, find me a certain type of restaurant around me, you can actually say, make a reservation for 7 o'clock at the best, you know, French restaurant in the area. And what it's going to do is, first up, it's going to pull up Yelp, and it's going to find all the restaurants in the area. It's going to sort those by ranking. And then it's going to use OpenTable to actually make a reservation at that uh, at that restaurant at that specific time, which I think, you know, is really cool. I was actually telling people this was... This is a feature that act- Apple actually took out of Siri when they bought it. When Siri was an independent app, it had this open table integration, and I used it a couple times, and like literally my mind was blown. I was like, this is the future. We're here. It's over. <laughs> you know, we Just give to- me the jetpacks. <laughs> give me the jetpack. The- Why am I not hovering? Like, it's, it's crazy <laughs> how many – because you're basically taking you know, bits of data from three and four different tasks – combining it together and having it all automated for you using Siri. So really cool stuff. But the the end takeaway from this is that if you're a restaurant, give serious consideration to OpenTable. And I know there's cost concerns because OpenTable has kind of a unique pricing structure and there are, you know, a few businesses that say, oh, it's it's just not the the way that I want to run my reservations. I like to have a more personal reservation system. But You know, with the ability to just talk to your phone and say, hey, make me a reservation at, uh, you know, my favorite restaurant for seven o'clock and have that automatically taken care of through OpenTable. That's extremely slick, extremely easy, extremely future future thinking. And so, you know, in my mind, it would be a reason for considering OpenTable if you haven't already and maybe giving it a second shot if uh, if you had written them off before but said, hey, if, if it really becomes necessary, I might reconsider. Yeah, and and uh, if you're averse to it at first, it's a matter of, you know, if it's a matter of principle or whatever the case may be, the bottom line is, is that people are going to be now kind of uh, somebody is going to basically take many of these iPhone users by the hand and essentially walk them up to open table and say, hi, so, and so this is open table. You should check them out because it's in the application. Now it's in the operating system. It is the default thing that's right there when you search for those location based queries. And I think as we might've talked about last week or, or the week before, you know, we saw some data that showed out of all of the mobile interactions with the web or the mobile web interactions uh, uh, that are that are happening right now that 20% of them are related to location based queries and that they are actually it's actually increasing and so again as users get used to this now they're going to suddenly have open table put right in front of them kind of served on a plate so to speak and uh, and and so it's going to increase the traffic that open table has period just for that simple uh addition uh to the operating system and same thing again you had mentioned yelp earlier here and you know in mo- in, in that case as well people don't even realize that they're looking at yelp uh they the, it's the data that comes from yelp and if you go ahead and you tap on something it takes you over to yelp but uh, it's kind of like what was google what's google's loss is now apple's gain because you know it was a year ago or, or more where uh Google was trying to acquire Yelp and that whole thing fell through. Now Yelp has become the backbone of data for all of the reviews, for photos, for the locations and for information about all of the locations that now you look up on, on maps and find. So every single time, I don't know about you, Corey, but I do that tons and tons of times. And I'm sure a lot of listeners do as well, that when you have your phone, whether you're using Siri to do the, the, the search or not, it's going to bring you on, on the map. It brings you to a location, and that's where the information is. That's the phone number. That's kind of potentially your first introduction to information about the particular location. And now that it's all augmented by Yelp data, Yelp plays an even greater part uh, of kind of just the average uh, location-based business needing to really make sure that their data is okay. In fact, even your ratings are visible there. So your ratings now have are, are even more visible. Even the photos that you have, if you have no photos for your business, then put some up yourself at least uh, because they've, they've really kind of in an interesting way pulled those photos from your site. Uh, and you'll see in the show notes some areas where we, uh, we found like uh, the demo that they had at WWDC. There was this photo above and we all kind of, I think, scratched our head and said, where are they getting the photos from? Like default photos. And then, uh, and then somebody pointed out that there, here is the, I guess, the default photo that's up on this particular business, and that was was used to kind of 
uh, embellish the the uh, places results that are displayed in maps similar to it almost looked like a cover image on uh, Facebook's um, Facebook's timeline view right yeah and this was something that I was actually doing a little bit of digging around on because the link that we'll show in the show notes is a photo from The Verge and that's what I was watching the live stream of the actual event on. And they gave a little bit of free publicity to Citizen Chain Bicycles, which is a bicycle shop in San Francisco. That's what Apple actually used to demonstrate their info cards. So let's say you said to Siri, find me a bicycle shop around around here. It would show you a bunch of these different bicycle shops. And if you clicked on Citizen Chain, it would flip over and show all the information about that business. And like Adam said, a lot of that is getting pulled from Yelp. And so... I looked at this and I said, oh, it has a really cool kind of like cover photo style image behind it. And I wonder where they're pulling that data from. So I went to Citizen Chain on Yelp and I looked around and I was like, well, Yelp doesn't have cover photos. Like, how did this even happen? So I looked inside of the photos and it just happens to be one of the user submitted photos. And so what's interesting is I'm sure somewhere this Yelp user was like, holy crap, that's my photo in an Apple event. I'm sure that was like... (laughs) Super awesome for them, but you know, it seems like I would dig around a little bit, and, and maybe Yelp's going to allow businesses to select, like, hey, this is my favorite photo that's been taken at my establishment, and and kind of promote that up, or maybe it's just Apple pulling data from Yelp and saying, okay, which of the photos has the most likes on it, and we'll kind of automatically turn that into a little bit of a cover photo. So definitely worth poking around a little bit and seeing what you can discover for this. But at the very least, you know, like Adam said make sure you've got a lot of high quality photos because there's three tabs. There's info, reviews, and photos. So info, that's something you have full control over. We've mentioned a lot of times before, go to Yelp, make sure your info is correct. Reviews you have no control over. So basically, people are going to go out there. Well, you do have control, right? You have control in the sense that you should be doing a darn good job for your customers. (laughs) This is true. So you have control in the sense that, yeah, you can try to keep your customers happy and make sure that they go to Yelp and leave you good (laughs) reviews. But but photos is sort of that middle ground. I think photos is something that you have to work a little bit harder at. But, you know, hey, if you notice somebody in your store, they're taking a lot of great photos, maybe just say, hey, I really like those photos and I'm trying to build up my Yelp profile. You know, is there any chance you would upload those? And and maybe it's just not even something they've thought of. But with a recommendation, they'll say, oh, sure, I'll, I'll go and, and add those to your Yelp review. You know, I love your store and I'd love to help you pub- publicize it. So take a little bit of effort, see if you can find ways of getting photos, maybe even run, you know, a photo contest. Say, Hey, for the next month, That's we're going true. to, we're going to look at all the new photos that get added to Yelp and we'll pick one. We'll pick our favorite one. We'll contact that person. We're going to give that person, you know, a free meal or $20 off their next purchase and, and find creative ways of, of really motivating people to go and share photos because, you know, we all live in this Instagram world. Now we're all taking photos. All you need is that extra step to actually share that on Yelp. And, I think it's going to be increasingly important as photos come to play a central role in the new iOS operating system. Do you think that, you know, as I was thinking about it a little bit and you were saying, hey, you know, this could be something Yelp adds, it really could be something that Yelp adds because we, you know, we talked often about it being a more visual world where, uh, you know, before it was all about data. Now it's really about kind of adding design and that polish to the to that experience. Uh, I think Yelp could very much change things and, and, and do that and, in fact, use that as kind of a trend across maybe other partners that they're working with, none that are more kind of uh, visible, as visible as, as Apple. Um, but could we be seeing kind of the potential, like, inkling of of almost like um, – even non Yelp, I mean, there could be this could be used as almost like a digital uh, menu. You know, for instance, Foursquare, which we'll talk about in a second, has tried to um, add menus to their app, and I, I think even right now they still haven't really taken it as far as it really could be. Because I noticed that when I go to a place and I use Foursquare and I look at it, it's not appealing at all for me to look at the menu that they have because it's just a bunch of text, mm-hmm. and I really want to kind of be struck kind of by the the photos that I see of particular dishes and so it just it just kind of uh, got me thinking a little bit about how that could carry especially over to food places uh, to, you know to restaurants um, uh, I mean almost probably any of them any sort of business could really start using the visuals a little bit more as a way to show off 
uh, what they have available on a menu or products that they have available or, or, you know, fashion places or whatever in a much more visual way. And, you know, Yelp right now is, is, is primarily user generated. So there isn't a lot of intention behind it, even though, of course, you can control that. You can add your images up there. It just kind of brings some interesting things to mind of the direction that some of these other applications could go. And even Yelp themselves, like you said, could uh, could take the whole website and the, the data that they give other providers uh, in the future. Yeah. So being a social, local, and most importantly, or, or I guess one-third as importantly, mobile show. <laughs> don't want to say most importantly, because we do love social, we do love local, but we are also a mobile show. I feel like the last thing we should make sure we cover is all of the updates that could very much affect applications. And there are a lot of companies out there that have their own application, and they're trying to find ways of promoting that on you know, both inside of iOS and, and in the mobile web environment. So there were a couple of interesting updates that relate to that. And I think we should, you know, quickly talk about those and how those could affect the way that companies promote their apps. So do you want to cover those real quick or you want me to go through those, Adam? Uh, let's see. I'll do it really, really quickly because I, I forgot to start the timer. So it's all a lucky guess at how quickly we need to go through here. But uh so news for apps, um, there are a number of ways to get discovered now in the App Store, which were not there before and, and are pretty uh, pretty awesome. Um, there are There's the ability to like an app, so actually Facebook like an app in the App Store, which gives a ton of visibility now uh, and likely connects folks to your app page potentially on Facebook. Maybe there's that option. There's the smart uh, app banner. So how many times have you seen uh, seen it when you go to a website such as Yelp that has a mobile app and it's telling you, by the way, we got a mobile app. And it's kind of you know taking its elbow and saying, please download our app and nudging you. Uh, well, now that you, there's there are the standard banners, some standard code that you can add to your site that will take people, you know, it'll detect uh, whether they have your app or not, and it'll take them to your app on the app store or open up the app if you, um, you if you do actually have the app installed. Um, so, you know, how can you, how can you, this will help increase the adoption of your app now if you end up uh, adding this. Some people may not even ever realize that you uh, that you have it available and uh, that you have an app available version, you know, of, of your site, or, or maybe it's not even even a uh, uh, shot for shot remake of your of your site. It's it's something that you're um, that you're really trying to push, and this will help you push it. Uh, Facebook in general has now um, been integrated into the operating system on both the iOS so the mobile operating system as well as the desktop operating system uh, in big ways. And they've been given a lot of prominence in a number of areas um, on on both operating systems, which is going to drive the Facebook sharing uh, in both cases. It's going to actually be pretty huge, I think. Um, and uh, pretty much anywhere across the entire OS is an option to share something. So whether that be photos or whether that be websites or whether that be, I mean, just something on the whim, you just want to share it. You have the opportunity to, to share that. Um, and so that's going to be really pretty incredible. Twitter has seen a 3x increase in iOS users on its site since integrating last year. And that something akin to 30% or maybe more, I thought we might've talked about this last time, uh, but say 30% or more of the, mobile of the mobile photos that are uploaded have been from Twitter. And that was just because they were integrated into operating system um, uh, last year. So we'll, it'll be very interesting to see the statistics a year from now after the Facebook integration. Uh, and then last, um, there's a whole bunch of new APIs that are opening up for Siri to allow, uh, I want to say her, I would say to allow her to, uh, to tell you some um, some interesting information beyond what she's been able to do over the last year, uh, for instance, there's stuff with with the, with Yelp. Uh, there's a lot of things having to do with sports and some other stuff. But I think uh, and and even the ability to launch applications. I still think you know they're just going to continue to press forward with Siri and do some pretty inc uh, incredible things that will allow brands uh, to plug into their APIs a little bit more. Again, this is for more technical folks. Uh, who might have a developer on staff, but uh, I would say to keep an eye on what Siri is able to do. Now Siri is introducing people to businesses uh, now using their Maps application and you know their general search for location-based stuff. Uh, so again, that all ties back to the same data as before the Yelp data. All right. Well, 
I mean, that feels like a pretty good coverage of the whole event, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I know. There's all the technical stuff we'd love to talk about as well, <laughs> but we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna bypass that, right? There you go. And the reason we're gonna bypass that is because there is a second and not quite as big, but you know, potentially equally as important announcement that came out this past week, and that was a huge Foursquare update. Foursquare is basically brand new. They they tore it down, they rewrote it from the ground up and said, All right, we've been out, we know what people use it for now. Let's let's point towards the future and let's say, how do we want people to be using Foursquare? What do we let's do with point all this towards data? Towards the future. Pointing towards the future, exactly. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, a whole bunch of, of interesting things to talk about here. And I would say, you know, the first and, and kind of what I was hinting at is they've really evolved Foursquare. So we're all familiar with Foursquare's check-in process, and that was basically going to a location, checking in, letting your friends know, hey, I'm here, you know, come meet me, or just keeping track of, like I do, for yourself, so that you can go back and say, how many times have I been to that coffee shop, or, you know, when did I have the, when was I last at this restaurant, or what did I think about it, that type of thing, so... It was this it was this check-in focused app and what they have now is just years and years of check-in data. They have millions of check-ins and tips and shares and likes and all this great data. And so what they're doing with that now is allowing users to open the Foursquare app and just say, "Hey, show me something around me to do." And if you read through this blog post that we'll point to on the Foursquare blog, they're just doing a lot of smart things. So for instance, if you open up the application at 11.30 in the middle of the day, it's going to find lunch spots around you, and it's going to find those based on lunch spots your friends liked, things that have a lot of tips, things that people have generally favorited. And then if you open up that application again at 6 o'clock, it's going to show you happy hours around you that have specials or things that your friends just checked into. So it's trying to point you to the things that are going to be most relevant, and it's doing so using that data. So... More than ever before, data is now extremely important on Foursquare, and you need to think beyond just how do I get people to check into my location, but how do I get people to do things like add tips or add my location to lists or share photos, because that's what's really going to drive users to your location when they just open up Foursquare and say, hey, you know, show me something fun to do. If your business has a lot of tips and a lot of photos and a lot of you know, trips that it's a part of, Foursquare is more likely to point that user towards you. It's basically giving you free foot traffic. And what's more valuable than free foot traffic? I can't think of very many things that would fall into that category. Yeah, it, funny enough is today I ended up going to uh, going to a restaurant that I had never been to until last Friday. Uh, somebody, we were out there meeting with a client and somebody said, where do you want to go eat? And I said, I went to this place down the street. You know, last week it was awesome. Let's try it. And so while we're there, um, I said, you know, they said, well, what did you try last time? I said, I had the fish and chips combo uh, plate. And they were like, oh, really? You know, and I was kind of describing it to them. And then I happened to be opening Foursquare and I look and my photo sitting there that I took from the last time that I was, you know, there. And I was able to actually show it to them and show them some of the other food. And they ended up ordering the the dish because they saw it there you know i mean that's just one little part uh, of it but they but but it's become uh where where they once kind of tucked away things like photos for instance now they're making it much more a part of the overall experience and the check-in is is part of it and they keep it as this kind of universal button that's up at the top right of the application but they've definitely focused less on the the whole it's it's much less about gamification and checking in and much more now about kind of seeing where your friends are and what they're doing and discovering there's a lot of discovery and discovering new places um I will say that I've and you you saw my rant on Facebook that a few folks you know commented on, but initially I, w- I was a little disappointed because the mechanics behind it seemed to let the uniqueness that initially was Foursquare recede a little bit and have kind of very much kind of Facebook like mechanics initially, where you, you you comment on something and you like something, and in their essence of liking is is a heart that's right there, uh, but you you either comment something or you like it. Um, and have that sort of interaction with folks. And so I was a little bit kind of poo-pooing that initially and thought, uh, you know, come on, guys, you can be a little bit more innovative. But the more that I've been digging through it, you know, I still kind of wish that they would have kept away from kind of, let's just bring Facebook mechanics into it. Uh, but they, they definitely, uh, like you said, expanded upon how they could help providing relevant location-based content to folks 
uh, and connect to you with things that your friends are interested in and like, and in general, things across the, the board that seem to be getting the most, um, uh, what do you want to say, the most praise and the most um, engagement um, on Foursquare and its engine. And do you know whether or not they actually changed? I hadn't been to their website that often, and I know they gave it an update on their website, but did they actually also redo their entire website and launch that at the time of this application, Corey? Yeah, I think they did do a number of website uh, alterations and updates. It wasn't to the extreme level that their mobile site was. If, you know, if you're a frequent Foursquare user, it was literally night and day. The application basically everything changed, and it was all brand new. I think the website did get a little more focus on the images, and that's um, you know something I think we'll cover shortly. Focus on the images. Focus on tips and sharing, and really that data that surrounds the check-in, not just the check-in itself. And just to go back and briefly touch on one thing that you said, it's interesting that they do have the like button on every update, but if you open up a business page, you can actually dislike something. So there's a little broken heart. And what they're doing is they're using that to determine what people like and also what people don't like. So if a business has a number of broken heart you know, check-ins and people have basically said like, oh, I just do not like this place, it's essentially going to kill it in the Foursquare system, which I think is really interesting. So you, you know, you you have to be careful and keep an eye on this because if for some reason, you know, something's broken in your system and you're just pissing a couple of people off and they say, you know, hey, I just haven't had a good experience a number of times at this location. Maybe it's a, a bad customer service representative or, you know, I just I still haven't found a donut that I like. It, it seems to be a lot of mediocre stuff and they click dislike. Foursquare is going to kick you way down the list in terms of what they're going to prioritize when they're showing people things to discover. So there is a, a, you know, they encourage people to like things that they do enjoy and they get a lot of value out of, but they also give users the ability to dislike things, which I think is interesting and, and definitely something that businesses should be paying attention to. It, whereas in the past, people would concentrate a lot on Foursquare when it came to like check ins and loyalty in the sense of, you know, providing the mayor a discount or saying if you check in three or more folks at the same time, you'll get 10 percent off your bill or whatever. And that's still there. And that's all well and good. But I think what Foursquare is doing right here is really akin to to a really strong Yelp competitor. And I think anybody with a with a brick and mortar store uh knows how much traffic Yelp can actually bring to them and having the ability, like you said, to say the, to do the broken heart thing or do the, the heart thing right now it, it Foursquare is in its early stages of gain of, of gathering tons of data that it didn't really gather before. And we'll see it again. You know, uh, um, it, it's in it for the long haul. It has, all the backing that it needs to to be around for an, you know for another couple of years if nothing good happens to to the company, but um, I think that their pivot is in in this direction is going to make them really the next best Yelp competitor and potentially be the flavor of that sort of service that people prefer more over Yelp. Mm-hmm. Again, I think the the only problem we see now is is that Yelp itself is so far integrated with Apple as we just discussed that that that's going to make it very, very difficult for, um, for Yelp to, 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 to kind of have any problems, I guess you'd say in this space, but Foursquare definitely is a place that I think now people will go to discover new places more than they ever have before. And that we'll see some interesting things pop up and their website, especially, which before was really kind of more of a dashboard about what you were doing personally and how you were checking with your friends now has become another engine where you could just go straight directly to the website instead of using the application. If you want to discover, new places you want to go eat or discover businesses that you want to go and, and, and frequent. Yeah. Um, they're really putting a huge focus on photos. So, um, when you first check in right below that check-in half the screen is now taken up by a little box that it wants you to fill with a photo. And if you do add a photo, Foursquare is actually sending out weekly summary emails of all the interactions your friends have had. And the first box on this week's weekly summary email was photos taken by friends. So that was above trips it recommends you add or places it thinks you'd be interested in the very first thing it shows you is hey check out these photos that your friends took so photos now have a lot of value in the foursquare system and it's getting even easier to add them into that database so things like easy integration with instagram means that people visiting your store are you know maybe they're they like instagram they're just so so on on foursquare but hey they they push things to foursquare and they do check in 
Instagram can now be used to add photos to your location. And like we saw with Yelp, these are just going to be increasingly important as people, before they go somewhere, they want to pull up those photos. They want to see what the food looks like. They want to see what the inside of that business looks like. So what can you do to encourage people to share photos? Because, you know, really these photos are now a very valuable asset to you as a business. So do some effort and and return some of that value to the users that are going through the effort to post those photos. So maybe, you know, print out some of your favorites and put it up next to the cash register and say, hey, these are photos that our happy Foursquare users have shared. And we'd love if you shared your photos too. And, you know, come show us your photo and we'll give you $5 off. Because really $5 at the end of the day compared to the amount of return you're going to get from having all of this really great visual content in Foursquare is a very small investment. So, Look for ways and and just get creative with it. I'm not saying you have to throw a ton of money at it, but just look at ways of returning the value to users that are out there and they're building up your profile and basically doing the work for you. Yeah, and and just real the last thing before we hit our uh, our tool of the week and our our lightning round here is just go ahead and and just if you haven't got Foursquare yet or if you do, you know, make sure you've got it upgraded and check out the Explore tab just to see how front and center. Uh, it is to, 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 I mean, it's very akin again to Yelp and being able to look up things. You just hit it, you know, for me, for instance, it says where my location is. It says, do you want to look at top picks near your location? Do you want to look at food or nightlife or shopping or what's trending at this particular moment? Uh, or even things that have specials on Foursquare. And so they did have that on Explore before. They've made it even more, uh, prominent now and, um, I just think that they're moving in the right direction for being kind of not just the not just the known as the check-in application or the check-in uh, service. All right. Well, like you said, let's move on to the tool review and the tool the tool that I selected for this week's show is actually App Annie A P P Annie, and this is a application data tracking service. So I thought, hey, we're talking about Apple, we're talking about iOS. Let's talk about a very specific tool for those of us that are developing iPhone applications and trying to keep track of how well they're doing in the market. So App Annie is actually a service that I personally use, so I have a lot of experience with it. I'm a big fan of it, and the first reason of that is it's free. So, hey, I mean, there's no no barrier to entry here. You basically go to appannie.com, and you can sign up, and you know within 24 hours, you're getting useful data on your application. So... One of the real nice things that they do is they're only focused on tracking application data. There's a lot of competitors out there that, hey, they'll track your app data, but they're focused on helping you market apps or helping you add advertising to your app or helping you do all these things. App Annie says, you know, forget that. We're only focused on providing really quality information about your app. So what it's going to do is use your iTunes Connect info to pull all of the information about your app on a daily basis into a dashboard. So... It's doing things like tracking sales, it's tracking rankings, and if you get reviews, it also adds that into a daily email summary that it sends out. And the daily email summary is a great way to, you know, at a glance, look at, hey, how is my app doing? So it says, this many sales today, here's how that compares to yesterday, here's where that puts you in the App Store ranking. It's a really quick way to view all that, and you can do it on the go, because it actually, the emails are mobile optimized, and this was something that I had emailed them about initially because they weren't mobile optimized. And so I was having to scroll all around on my phone. They fixed that. You can open up these emails on your phone and it just gives you, you know, the core data that you want to be keeping track of. Because if you see a huge spike or you see a huge drop, you want to try to track that down. And you can do that by then logging into App Annie. And they have, you know, real nice charts that look back at 30 days of data. And again, it's all free. So there's no downside to this. It's just making the information that Apple makes available on its own easier to use. It's making it more visual. It's making it trackable on a daily basis. You don't have to log into your account. It does that for you. Um, And the other nice thing that it does is it allows you to compare your app to your competitors. So you can see what's working for them, where they're ranking, where you're ranking in comparison. You can compare that data You know, maybe you're looking to enter a certain market and you want to get a little bit of background information. They actually have all of this free information available on their site. So you can see, you know, where do these apps rank? How well have they been doing in terms of sales over the past month or the, you know, the past 60 days? A lot of great information. So if you're an app developer, I would say App Annie is almost a must use. You've got to at least try it out. You got to see if it fits your into your workflow because a ton of great value and, you know, it's free. They their revenue stream comes from some of the 
larger sort of research that they do, they sell that. But in terms of this daily app monitoring, that's all free. It's an added value service. So, you know, I give it, uh, if we were doing a, a star system, I'd give it five out of five. I love App Annie. I'm a huge proponent of it. And uh, like I said, I use it every day. So definitely something to check out. Do you see any downside at all? I mean, you said five out of five, and and of course it's been being given free. So uh, and and you're showing, you know, like you said, you're able to compare against your competitors. So is it something where, for instance, somebody who may not be want to be seen against their competitors might want to opt out of something like that? Well, this is not information exclusive to app annie i think it's just presented well by app annie so there's a okay. lot of these rankings out there it's all publicly available information it's just they're gathering that all and making it easy to access so you know i guess if you were super secretive but most people can tell how well an app's doing they can you know if it's in the the top 100 chart it's doing well and if it's not it's not so um i think that it's not really giving up any information that an intelligent competitor wouldn't be able to get elsewhere it's just making that process easy. And I think it's more focused on helping app developers understand their own application. I don't think the focus is like, hey, go out and discover like secret ways to take down your competitors. I think that's, you know, you can get some of that information, but that's really not their focus. Their focus is on showing you, here's how your app's doing day over day. Here's how it's been trending over the last 30 days. And, you know, just making that information easy to access. Very, very cool. And, uh, I, I totally forgot that you have an app out. You have more, you have more than one app out. <laughs> Just a single app. It's uh it's Brew Review. It's a beer review and and I, I like to call it a journal app. So if you're a fan of craft beer, you can go to brewreview.com and it allows you to keep track of all the beers you try, what you like about it, what you didn't like about it, and and turn that into kind of a database. So uh, I use App Annie to track that. If at some point I developed another app, I would certainly use App Annie for that as well because it allows you to track, uh, I think, an unlimited number of apps, which is another nice benefit of it as well. So it, it just displays those each as their own little chart on your on your dashboard. So you know it expands as well. It'll grow with you and and uh, does that again all for free. So all right, well, uh, Adam's new favorite part of the show is coming up next. That's the <laughs> lightning round. That's the we are actually timing ourselves, so therefore we'll stick to the script round. <laughs> uh, do you have the timer ready? I do. I got it all queued up here, ready to go. Okay, one minute on so, the clock. So um, you know you submitted most of the stories. The third one is one that I'm familiar with, but uh, I will take a stab at being first for this particular one. Is that okay? You go on first. All right. All right. Well, I will uh, start the clock. Ready, set, go. All right. So Google has what they call their Google Trusted Stores program, uh, and they released that just recently. And they've been testing it with a, uh, a select number of online merchants because they are finding that folks are saying that they do not trust stores or, or online merchants that they don't know very well or they're not familiar with. And so, therefore, they're a bit scared of purchasing stuff online. And Google, being somebody who offers a payment system, is uh, wanting that uh, to increase You know, online purchases. So they are providing a kind of better business bureau sort of seal for certain shoppers to show the uh, that they are a trusted store from their program uh, and what kind of rating that they have similar to kind of a better business bureau rating again as I mentioned and so we're seeing this as a possibility to roll out and be kind of a trust system for online merchants that they're actually even displaying within search results within AdWords uh, results which is kind of interesting enough so two one Corey what do you think about this all right, starting the timer, go. So I like this system. I think that you know we've seen it with things like eBay where ratings and reviews definitely help to increase consumer trust. So I, I know that I've done it. I go to eBay, and if somebody's got less than, you know, my cutoff is usually like a 95 or 96%. Anything less than a 95 or 96% customer satisfaction rating, and I'm just not going to shop there. And so What Google realized is, hey, we're trying to drive traffic to these stores, but people get there and they wonder, like, is this something I can trust? So they're trying to act as sort of this better business bureau for the web. They're trying to say, hey, this is a trustworthy store. Us as Google are kind of putting our name behind it, which, I mean, that's got a lot of a lot of weight behind it. Consumers know and trust the Google brand. So I would say if you're If you've got an online store, you should definitely check out this program. You want to make sure that you're getting a positive review because it could help drive happy customers to your store. 
And I got a couple extra bonus seconds on that one, so nice. I will. Uh, we'll, we'll donate them to charity. I'll donate those to charity, exactly. So I will let you lead on the next one. All right. Starting the timer now. So the next story up is the Facebook App Center. This is... Um, been announced for a while. It wasn't. It wasn't necessarily a surprise. It was sort of expected and and kind of rolled out over time. But this is Facebook looking to bring together all of their applications and actually highlight the ones that are useful to a individual user. So what's interesting is they're looking at data for a user's friends and saying, hey, these are applications that your friends use, your friends like. So you're not just going to get these random, you know, Zynga ads for things that you don't really care about. It's trying to find applications that are especially useful to you within your friend circle. What I also like about it is it has a special app center just for the mobile. So if you load up Application Center on your mobile phone, it's going to highlight other mobile applications that use Facebook data and are kind of enhanced by this Facebook data. So whether that's friend relationships or friend data, and it's going to allow you to launch into the App Store right from the App Center. So I think it's a a big win for app developers. All right, Adam, 60 seconds on the clock. What's your take on the Facebook App Center? So those who are familiar with Facebook in the past might have remembered they, the kind of, uh, I guess they would call them apps as well that they had when they first developed the, the, the application platform on Facebook. And so this is really kind of a big step up from that. And like you said, especially because they've made tailored ones for iOS and Android uh, and even the mobile web that um, it, it, it kind of, you know, for those who are maybe potentially mobile only folks, especially they're going to find stuff that's more, more relevant to them. We're already seeing that anybody who has a platform like this is basically starting an app store. So we've got Google with their Google play and their whole app store for Chrome. We've got Apple, of course, and we've got Facebook and, and, and even, uh, to some extent, even Twitter with one, uh, with a 140 um, application center, which uh, HubSpot has acquired. So, it's it's a good thing. You might take a look now at establishing how your application can be best be optimized for all of these different app store platforms. All right. Snuck that one in just in time. Very nice. Yep. So finally, you want me to take a crack at Facebook WordPress integration? Go for it. All right. 60 seconds on the on the timer. Let's see how I do. So Facebook today announced really deep integration with WordPress, which I think is good for both WordPress and for Facebook. And we're looking at back-to-back Facebook stories here. So obviously Facebook is making big pushes into the social world now that it's a public company. But what this is allowing WordPress owners to do, and it works for both WordPress.com and WordPress.org, so both the WordPress hosted and the self-hosted sites, is add in a lot of these Facebook widgets directly into your WordPress feed with just a couple of clicks. So you can do things like the activity feeds, the recommendations, uh, customized like boxes, even things like customized subscribe and send buttons, all from within your WordPress dashboard. So if you're a WordPress developer and you're at all interested in promoting that content onto WordPress, you know this is a huge win. It also allows you to automatically publish your posts from your blog onto Facebook with full control over the images and the titles and even who gets tagged in that update. So big win for blog writers and developers. All right, just in time. Phew, I didn't think I was going to get to that okay. one. Hold on, let me let me stretch out a second. Preparing, oh, preparing. Got to end strong. End strong on this one now. All right, ready, All right. ready. Sixty seconds on the clock. Ready, go. Uh, as a, as somebody who has worked with some clients and actually integrated uh, Facebook into different plugins and such, Facebook is notorious for having one of the most difficult and worst developing platforms. Period. And so, for them to finally develop something like this, that is so kind of, uh, I mean, it's 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 so tightly integrated with WordPress uh, and done directly by the Facebook developers. Is good. It's uh, unfortunate that it's taken so long, but there's a lot of really cool things that they're providing here, and a lot of cool options that they're providing that will allow your, you know, your WordPress site doesn't need to be just a blog. It could be your website. It could be used as your CMS. So this is integration not into blogs, but also websites in general. And because it's coming from Word, uh, excuse me, directly from Facebook, uh, it, it it's you know it's hopefully going to be stable in comparison to the uh, other development platforms that they have. So it's a, it, like you said, it's a win-win. There you go. And with that, you scored yourself a couple of bonus seconds. Going in the piggy bank. Donate those to charity. <laughs> yep. 
All right. Well, uh, I think that wraps up our main part of the show today. So we do have a couple of quick wrap-up announcements. And the first is, like Adam said, we have one more ticket to give away to the Social Loco Show. So, Adam, I'll put this out there and then let me know if you want to change it up. But I was thinking we could keep it pretty simple again this week. So... Because we're trying to help people discover the Social Loco show as well, what I was thinking is, in order to get entered for a free ticket, have people tweet, I want to go to the Social Loco show, and include a link to Social Loco, and then have that include the hashtag Solo Mo Show hashtag, and that way, you know, it's helping to spread the word and basically saying... I'm interested in going. I would love to get a free ticket from Solo Mo Show, but also, you know, I think other people should check this out. It's a super valuable uh, conference to attend. What do you think about that? I think that's awesome. All right. So why didn't we think of that three three weeks ago? <laughs> Where was that idea? <laughs> uh, so just you've been keeping that one in the back pocket for a while, Corey. I know. So to summarize, if you are interested in winning a free ticket to the Social Loco Conference, send a tweet that says, "I want to go to Social Loco," and includes a link to the Social Loco site, and then just hashtag that with hashtag Solo Mo Show. That way, we can actually find it. And what we'll do is we will find all the people that do promote the Social Loco show using that hashtag. We will randomly select one of those people, and that person will win a ticket to attend the conference and also hopefully stop by our booth and check us out as we're doing the live show from the Social Loco conference. So, You know, the one thing to add to this, and funny enough is I didn't realize until after we got halfway through how kind of developer-heavy a lot of our discussion was, uh, but talking to Mark, who is the uh, organizer for the Social Loco conference, he actually told me to make sure that we mentioned tonight, and I forgot at the intro, that this Saturday and Sunday is their big brand hackathon. So anybody who is a developer, who is uh, who is maybe even a group of, of, of folks like a startup, um, user interface designers, anybody who wants to get involved at all, they're going to be having, and this information is on socialloco.net if you click, I think it's Hackathon, they're going to be having Nokia, uh, Kraft, uh, Home Depot, and a whole bunch of other big brands. That's why it's called the Big Brand Hackathon. And they'll be giving away over thirty grand in prize money. And part of the reason that a lot of these brands are there is because they actually want to potentially pick up the idea that you have. And so they're going to be uh, – go take a look at what the details are on the site. But they essentially are just asking folks to build something that's social, local, or mobile – on top of certain elements that they have for these brands. And so take a look at it. The cost of the registration is normally $10, but here is a free coupon code for you. It's blue run uh, comp B B L U E R U N C O M P. And each of the beginning of those words is capitalized. And when you use it, you'll get free tickets and you can share it with everybody and uh, spread the word. All right. Well, that sounds good. And, Awesome event, so I encourage people to check that out in addition to the main Social Loco conference. So with that, we want to thank the audience. We are greatly appreciative of everyone that both listens to the episodes and also listens this far into the episodes. I think we once again cracked the hour mark. We're we're doing our best to keep it short, but when there is this much exciting news to talk about, sometimes that's tough. So we do appreciate <laughs> everybody that has you know listened to prior episodes or listened to this episode and uh, is is finding value out of it to the point where you've made it to the end here. And if you are finding value out of the show, the one thing that we would ask is that you rate it in iTunes. That's a really great way for us to get the show out there, help build the audience. So, you know, if you're getting value out of the show, the one thing that we would ask to return some of that it would be to rate us on iTunes, preferably both giving it a star rating and also just writing a little bit about what you think. That helps us to, uh, again, build the audience up. And that's how Apple selects things like their new and noteworthy section. They look for shows that get a lot of positive reviews and feature them there. So we would definitely appreciate a rating in iTunes. And if you like, would like to get in touch, and that could be for a number of reasons, maybe you want to ask us questions, you want to suggest topics, you want to give feedback, or hey, maybe you just want to say hi, you want to get in touch and, uh, and meet Adam and I on a more personal level, there's a number of ways to do that. And the first and probably the easiest is to reach us via Twitter. So we can be reached at Solo Mo Show, or you can reach myself directly. I'm at Corey O'Brien. And I'm at Secret Sushi. 
We're also happy to communicate via email. It's solomoshow at gmail.com. Or you can connect with us on Facebook, Google+, and Pinterest. We have pages and accounts and boards going on all those channels. So just go ahead and search for Solo Mo Show on Facebook, Google+, or Pinterest, and we should pop right up. And then a number of times today you heard us reference the show notes. The show notes is a collection of all the links and all the various stories that we've talked about today. So we publish those. So you can follow along with the show. You can open those. You can read through them as we're discussing them and really, you know, keep yourself up to date. Maybe pass along some of those links and, and make yourself look smarter uh, uh, in the process. So we publish the show notes in a number of places. The easiest way to find those would just be to go to solomoshow.com. Each episode gets its own post, and that post includes all of the links to the show notes. And then if you're listening to this in a podcast player, whether that's on iTunes or uh, on a mobile podcast player, there should be an option to view show notes. So just look around. It's in different places depending on what player you're using, but we promise they're there. So find the show notes, click on them, check them out, and follow along as we discuss those during the show. And with that, I think we uh, we can successfully call episode 23 a wrap, and we will see everyone next week. Take care. Take care.